Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise our Rebbe, our pastor, our teacher, and our friend, Pastor Cindy Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. God bless you all. It's so good to see you all this evening. Um, let's open our Bibles to, actually, let's go to John chapter 1. And it's not on the screen here, but John chapter 1, verse 1. That will be our opening scripture tonight. John chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to ask Dr. Vicky to come to the front and, and, and to, to lead us in this reading, please. It's so good to see you all tonight. How are you all doing this evening? Good. Yeah. Excellent. All right. John chapter 1, and we'll read just um, um, verses 1, 2, and 3 together. Three. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in him in the beginning with God. All things were created by him, and without him was not one thing made that was made. Excellent. Thank you, Sister Dr. Vicki. And you may be seated. It's so good to see you all tonight. And tonight, our teaching is on the 22 letters of the alphabet from Psalm 119. And just to uh, repeat from the last three weeks, this is for the only part I'll repeat, it, it is Jesus is the Word. Amen? He was in the beginning. He was with, he was with God the Father even before time it, it was created. And the Word was made flesh, meaning that He was conceived in the womb of, of the Virgin Mary. And all things were made by him, and, with, and nothing was made without him. And so tonight we're going to talk about 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and Jesus is the living alphabet. In English, we have 26 letters, and the 26 letters form all the words in our language. In Hebrew, we have 22 letters, but unlike English or any other language, the, 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 the living alphabet is God himself. It's God the Son himself. And the letters are creative. Jesus is creative. So even as God used the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet to make all of creation, well, guess what? Even tonight, as you are studying the alphabet, God is recreating your destiny, and He's giving you purpose, and He's gonna, and, and you're gonna come into such a, you're gonna come into your purpose this evening in a more clear way. Amen. So um, uh, thank you, Brother Joe, for bringing the slides up. Let's bring up the slide on the Aleph. It's, um, I believe it's. Uh, that one there. Hey, let's read this one together. It's, this is uh, Psalm 119, verse 1, and the Aleph corresponds to the first eight verses of Psalm 119. One, two, three. Praiseworthy are those whose way is perfect, who walk in the law of the Lord. So it's talking about what David is saying here is those that are praiseworthy are those that walk perfectly with God and who walk in the Torah of the Lord. Amen. And verse 1 begins with the Aleph, and Aleph represents the head. The head represents the intellect. And the, the way we, we first become close to God is to study the Word of God, to fill our minds with the Word. That the Word of God should consume us. So we, we begin our way by following the path of the Aleph, and the Aleph teaches us to study God's Word. Amen? And we covered that in last week as well. Now, but the, the takeaway here is Torah study, the study of the Bible, should be the highest priority of our lives. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the bet means, one of the meanings of bet is house. And the very first word of the Torah is bereshit, which begins with the letter bet. And that it's the very first letter, and it represents God making his habitation in lower in, in the reality of that, that we know. And in Psalm or Tehillim 119.9, which begins the second group of eight verses, let's read this together from the screen. In what manner should a man oh, I'm sorry, in what manner should a youth purify his way to observe according to your word? Now the word bet, the Hebrew letter bet represents understanding. So the first eight verses, David focuses on our intellect and the study of Torah. Then the second grouping of eight, verses 9 through 16, focus on understanding. So it's not enough just to learn the Word. We must learn how to apply the Word of God in our lives. Amen? 
So those verses, I'm going through this quickly because we did this last week. So verses 9 through 16 focus on understanding. It speaks about application. So we must apply Torah to our path. And it's not just in the church that we apply Torah. We apply the Torah in every area of our lives. In our relationships, in all of our connections, in our career, in, in, our, in every in endeavor. We apply Torah in everything. So I encourage you when you go home tonight, the takeaway from this grouping of eight is apply what you have learned tonight. Because I'll mainly be giving you Allah, but when you leave here, I want you to apply it. I want you to move in the realm of the bat and apply what you learned this evening. Then we come to the third letter, the next slide, the Gimel. Can you, let's say Gimel together. Gimel. And then let's read this verse together. Tehillim 119 verse 17. Bestow kindness upon your servant. I shall live and I shall keep your word. Do you see David's dependence upon God? How dependent upon God's word he is? You know, I don't see very many people today that are very dependent upon God's word. But David has made the word, the Torah, his complete lifeline. I mean, he'll live and die by it. it is, the word of God and his relationship with God is more important than anything in his life. More important than his family, more important than his career, more, more important than his kingship. It, it, is, it, it consumes him. And, and most of us have our lives upside down. And I'm including myself in, the, in, the, in this conversation. It's, it's like I, sometimes I let the worries of life take a priority in my life. I take the stresses of situations in the workplace and wherever and family stuff to take the forefront. Where and it's just reversed. God should be at the forefront. Yeah. The anointing should be at the center of my life, and things of the world should not consume me. It, and, and that is not easy. It's easy to say, but it's very difficult to to implement. But God will help us to perform the bet, to actually practice what we're learning, right? Keeping God's word is not easy, it's very challenging. God would not give it to us if it were easy, because He wants us to depend upon Him to, en to enable us to fulfill His word. That means if someone tells me some very juicy piece of gossip, it'll be very difficult for me to hold it back. I need help to be able to restrain myself. And there's some things that don't come natural to me, God will help me to overcome. Isn't that true? Amen. Yes. Unless you don't struggle with any form of sinfulness. And if that's the case, you don't need to be here because I need the Torah to help me yeah. with every area of my life, and especially with my sinful, my sinful ways. Yeah. So, and in Gimel, David is praying to God, bestow kindness upon your servant, I shall live and I shall keep your word. So Gimel, it looks like a, ma a man that's hunched forward a little bit with one foot extended and he's rushing to perform an act of, of kindness. He's rushing. And in this case, it does, re it does represent us showing kindness to others, but it also represents God running or Messiah running to perform acts of kindness to us. And it's this, also in this grouping of eight verses, D David asks the Lord to unveil his eyes. And that means, unless God unveils my eyes, I will not see wondrous things in God's Word. Because this book cannot be understood in only in the natural way. To go into the depth, you need God to unveil your eyes. Amen? So it's God who will reveal the mysteries of Torah to you. Now let's go to the next one, the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that's the Dalit. Can you all say Dalit with me? And let's read, let's read the verse together. Tehillim 119, verse 25. My soul clung to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Now, I really enjoy teaching this one on Tuesday night in Granada Hills. The Dalit represents a, a person that is bent over, leaned forward completely in total humility. It, it's like a man that's bowing down. And the Dalit also represents a door. And I'm going to show you the scripture about the door in a moment. But it also speaks about us. Our natural inclination is towards our sinful inclination, which is the Yetzer Hara in Hebrew. It's natural for us to sin, but it's not natural for us to live a life of righteousness. So how many of you had to be taught as, as a child how to sin? Not one of us, it comes naturally. There was no seven step program you went through to learn how to sin, it's something that came naturally. If you didn't want to share your toys with somebody else, usually no one taught you how, to not, how not to share. It was something that comes natural. 
but sharing is something that takes teaching. So, and then we all have areas in which we are clinging to our sinful nature. It could be sinful thoughts, lustful thoughts. It, it could be anger, whatever it may be. Those are areas in our life that, in which we are clinging to the dust. So we cry out to God. And we say, God, revive me according to your word. So as you, the more you meditate in God's word, the more God's going to unstick you, uncling you. And, and instead of clinging to the flesh, you're going to cling to him. Because no person can serve two masters. You, you're either going to hate one and love the other. So what we, what we want to learn how to do is learn how to hate the evil inclination. You know, I forget where I heard this, but there was someone that was, um, I think it was Catherine Coleman in a service asked a person if you want to be set free from uh, whatever sin. I'm not sure if it, was, if it was alcoholism or whatever it was. He asked him if he wanted to be set free. And he said, no, he loved his sin. He loved his drinking too much. And you know what? What I really like about what this man said is he spoke the truth. And sometimes we love our thing. We, we love our substance too much. And look at the rich ruler that came to Jesus. He wasn't willing to separate from his possessions. Possessions is not always monetary. Monetary. It could be anything that you love more than God. And anything that keeps you from serving God in a more full, in a fuller way. Now the Dalit also parts, because every letter has multiple levels of understanding. The Dalit represents a door. And what David is doing, David is seeking the door which will open the way for him to that will open the door for him to achieve the path of truth. So David clinging, to, David clinging to the dust represents clinging to physical desires. But David is praying for divine assistance in order to overcome all of his temptations. And what does Jesus say in Revelation? He says, I know, he says, I am the door. Revelation 3, it says, I know your works. I have set before you an open door. And, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, so whatever little strength you have, turn towards the word, which is Jesus. Turn towards the door, which is Jesus. And don't deny his name, but just look to the door, and he'll, he'll, find, he'll provide a way out of that temptation for you. And God was faithful to Joseph, that when, David was, when, when Joseph was about to sin with Potiphar, the Lord showed him the door, and he, and he, and he, and he fleed the house of Potiphar, and, and, he, and he avoided committing that sin. The next letter is the letter H. Hey. Can you say, look at your neighbor and say, Hey. hey. <laughs> Hope you don't mind a little humor tonight. So the letter H, hey, and it's uh, Tehillim 119, verse 33. Let's read this together. Instruct me, O Lord, in the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it at every step. Now the Talmud teaches us that God created the world with the letter H. Hey. And if you look at the four-letter name of God on the wall on your, on your left, it says uh, it has four letters. It has, it has a yud and a hey, a vav, and a hey. The second letter is the hey. So that's what it looks like. The shape of the letter shows us how we fashion my, mankind. And the letter represents free will. One of the, meaning, one of the representations of this letter is that God created us with free will. So if you look at the le le this letter, on the upper left is a small gap. You all see that? That's, and if you look at the very bottom of that letter, you see a wide gap. Now, I forgot to upload this document, but I will upload this document any day now. and It'll be right under the teaching for tonight. So, the, the narrow opening on the top left, actually, before I explain it, let me give you a New Testament scripture. Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. So the narrow gate is that narrow gap at the top left. The, 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 the wide gate is the bottom. The way to heaven, the way to the kingdom of heaven, is very narrow and very few enter in. And even in the natural, in your careers, in all that you do in life, to, to be very successful in life and to get, achieve great results in life, it, 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 it takes very few accomplished great things and it, and it, and it, it, it takes tremendous effort. And that's represented by the narrow gate. But the roadway to hell, the roadway to destruction, the roadway to sin, the roadway to, me to mediocrity is a very easy road. And that's represented by the gap at the bottom. Because God has created us with free will. God does not force us to perform His good will. He wants us to choose to do His will. And when we struggle with doing His will, we cry out to God that, Lord, help me to cleave to you. 
help me to accomplish your will. Let's go to the next one. The next letter is the letter, let's all say it together, Va. And, we'll, and that begins in Tehillim 119.41. Let's read this together. And may your acts of kindness befall me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. This Hebrew letter Vav represents truth because it stands perfectly straight. And David is asking God for the utmost truth in his life. And truth is not is, is correctly understanding the word of God, but truth, in addition, truth is also correctly assessing situations. Sometimes you may think everyone's angry at you, and you think the whole world is mad about you, and you think everybody's talking evil about you. You know what? If, if you think everybody looks at you in that manner, you might, you might need a dose of Bob, a dose of truth. The problem might not be everybody else. The problem might be you. So we must be willing to see the truth. It's not easy for us to embrace the truth, and it's not easy for us to receive correction. And it's not easy, and, and especially when you're set in your ways, you're so set in your ways and, and that it becomes difficult for you to receive any advice from somebody else. And so I encourage you all to ask the Lord on a constant basis, Lord, enable, give me the grace to be able to receive truth. And our Lord, allow me to be able to receive correction from other people and to, to, and to, and to walk in truth in all of my ways, in the church, in the workplace, in your family, in relationship, relationships. In every area of your life, allow God to deal in truth with you. And I'm telling you, correction is not easy to receive. I don't, know, I don't know anyone that loves to be corrected all the time. It's difficult. But you know what? We need to learn how to embrace it because we have to learn how to embrace truth just like everything else. Just as we have to learn how to be generous, we need to learn how to receive correction with humility. So David is asking God for the utmost truth in this verse. Now let's go to the next slide. The Zayin. Can you all say Zayin? Zayin. And in this letter, we're connecting the physical to heaven. Zayin, like every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, has a numerical value. I'll tell you what the numerical value of this one is because it's relevant to what I'm going to show you. Zayin has a value of seven. And when you think about seven, what comes to your mind? I'm just going to ask you to just to, uh, to, to shout it out. What? Creation. Creation, seven. I'm sorry? Completion. Completion, correct. Sorry, brother? Perfection. Perfection, excellent. Sister Debbie? Oh, you're scratching your head, sorry. So the seven, it, does, it speaks about completion. And, it, and it, it speaks about the completion of the physical. Seven days in a week. Seven, fe seven major feasts in the Bible. Se seven, uh, seven has to do, you know, just about with the perfection of anything. Let's read Tehillim 119.49 together, because this grouping of eight verses deals with Zion. Remember a word to your servant through which you gave me hope. So again, Zion has a numerical value of seven, and this number alludes to the spiritual word, world. In, in, the, in the previous letter, the Vav, which has a numerical value of six, speaks about the, the, compl the, the completion of the physical creation. How many sides are on a cube? Six. So we have six sides, and I know you all know that. So six sides, six sides in, in a cube. We live in a three-dimensional world, as far as we know it. And, um, but it, is, and it represents the completion of the physical. And Messiah will come before the end of the sixth millennium. So right now we are in the year 5778. In just about, about six weeks or so, I think about five or six weeks, we will be in... The, the next Hebrew year on Rosh Hashanah, which will be 5779. And from, all, what I, from, from my understanding of rabbinic studies, Messiah will come at the latest, the year 6000. Yes, sister? I was just going to say Oh, that's beautiful. That's correct. So, and that's, and that, that's prophetic as well. That's absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Zadevi. So, so the six speaks about the completion of the physical. But the seven represents connecting to the spiritual. So that's why all the Hebrew feasts are in sevens. Pes Passover or Pesach is a seven-day feast. We have so many, all the feasts are, are, are in sevens. And there are seven days in a week, and on the seventh day God rested on the Shabbat. 
So if the, the six completes the physical, the seven brings us into the spiritual. And that's why the Jews do not work on the Shabbat begin, beginning on, at sunset on Friday evening. They enter into a 24-hour period of rest. And God rested on the seventh day. Seven indicates the divine element where we connect with the physical world of creation. And, is, and the theme of Shabbat is to remember. And to, it reminds us that God is our creator. So when we come into the Zion, into the seventh, we, we come into the place of, it's not I that produce wealth, it's God that produces my wealth. And everything that I have in life is not because of me, whether it be your kids, your grandchildren, your careers, whatever you have, your, your talents, it's not because of you that you have that, it's because of your creator, because God bestowed those upon you. And every biblical feast, like I said earlier, is in a cycle of seven. And David is constantly remembering God and how God remembers him with kindness. So think, think, when you look at Zion, think about remembering. The first word in the verse, remember. Now the verse that I'm using, the translation I'm using, is from the Art Scroll to Helen. But if you go to Chabad.org, you can actually get, you can get the exact same text. I, 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 like, the, I like this translation much better than, than my King James translation. I mean, they're both excellent, but, but I, I really like this one. And it's easier for me to teach this, especially from, a, uh, from rabbinic sources by, use, by using this translation. So if one studies, now let's put, the Zayin also represents your livelihood and sustenance. And the person who, who fulfills the lessons of the first six letters will merit this. And I'm going to read this to you. If one studies and understands, Aleph and Bet, does kindness, Gimel, and cherishes the name of God, then he will certainly be blessed by having all of his physical needs provided for him. Now let's go to the next letter. Am I going too quickly tonight? No. All right. Let's go to, let's say het. Yes. And the het represents God's grace. It represents God's favor. To Hillel 119.57, let's read this together. One, two, three. The Lord is my portion, I said, to keep your words. The letter het represents God's grace. And if you follow in the ways of God, God will give you that gift of grace. He'll give you that, that grace of favor. And it also represents that, it represents us choosing God more than anything else in the world. You know, some people choose wealth. Some people choose a big family. Everyone chooses something as their primary aspiration in life. David's primary aspiration in life was not to become king over Israel. His primary aspiration was to make the Lord his inheritance. And you need God's grace to make him your inheritance. And David chose to find satisfaction in service to God. And I encourage every morning and all that you do is to find satisfaction in him. Find satisfaction in serving God. Amen. Amen. You can find satisfaction. I'm not saying don't find satisfaction in other areas of your life. I mean, I look for, for, for fulfillment in every area. I mean, I, I, I want my career to be fulfilling. I don't want it to become something that I just do because it's because I have to do it to make a living. I, I, I want to find satisfaction in every area of my life. But my greatest satisfaction comes from serving God and, from, and spending time with Him and having fellowship with Him. I encourage all of you to take time out every single day to be just to be alone with God, not with your devices, all your technology. I mean, as far as I know, you can't communicate with God through an email. But a little joke there. But I, I encourage you all to spend time with God and with your with your paper Bibles, paper, the paper word is very important, and just be with Him and allow Him to speak to you and just fellowship with Him and just worship Him. There's something about worship that's so important to help you overcome circumstances. Often we magnify our, 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 we magnify our situations when we should just worship Him and magnify Him, and our situations will be minimized. Amen? And God will cause you to do His good pleasure. And David is finding satisfaction in performing God's service. Look at what Jesus says in John 6, 38. And I'm going to ask Dr. Vicky if you can come up and read this for us. John 6, 38. If you have it, please say amen. For I came down from heaven 
not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Excellent. Thank you. So that's why, that's why Jesus came down from heaven. The Alam Tab came down from heaven. Not to do his own will, but to do the will of the Heavenly Father that sent him. And, that should be, and every one of you is here by God's divine design. He sent you down to perform his good will. To perform his good pleasure. Not one of you is here by accident. You're not here by the will of your parents. You're here by divine design. And God has a purpose in your life. I remember hearing the testimony, and I forget the lady's name. I saw a video of her, I think it was on, on YouTube. And she was talking about how she was supposed to have been aborted, but she survived the abortion. And how she became, she has become such a voice for life throughout the earth. And I'm telling you, every one of you has a voice in the earth. Regardless of what people have done to you, whether you've been molested in, in any way, you've been mistreated, you've been sold into, into slavery, whatever it may be, whatever your situation is, allow God to use that pain to bring healing to other people. Amen? And let your focus be on the needs of others, because God has a design for your destiny. God might be raising you up to raise up people to become multimillionaires. You know, every one of you has a purpose. Allow God to define you and allow Him to show you who you are in the earth. Because you have a purpose in the church. You have a purpose in the world. Allow God to bring out that purpose in you. Then let's go to the next Hebrew letter, the letter Tet. Can we all say Tet? Yes. Tet means good and has a numerical value of nine. Let's read verse 65 together. You have done good with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Let's try that again. You have done good with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Tet stands for good. And, the, and it speaks about Torah is a good possession. And if you look at the creation, throughout the creation in Genesis 1, God is always saying, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And I think, I believe it's seven times God says, it was good. And good designates something that is complete according to its purpose. That means I can say, I can say, Rebecca Marilyn is good because now she's walking in the full purpose of her creation. So when you come into that place where you're performing God's good pleasure, then guess what? You are called Tov. It is called good. You are called Tet. And this includes God's spiritual goals within creation. Good refers to the proper use of all of one all of one's God-given gifts. For, for those of you that are in school or studying or whatever you're doing, allow God to develop the gifts in you because God's going to use what, he, what, he's allowed, what, what you're learning. Because God is going to cause every one of you to fulfill His good pleasure. King David was a man that lived his life in, in, in an attitude of constant self-improvement. He did not live a life of mediocrity. His entire life was focused on improving himself. And when he sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah murdered, you know what? He, he repented and he learned and, and, and he, he, made, he took steps towards character refinement. And I encourage every one of you every single day to, to refine a different, a different aspect of your personality. If it's something in the workplace that you're struggling with, well, you know what? Focus on that one thing and, 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 and improve on it. If you're struggling with laziness, then you need to work on, work on that character flaw. But every day work on something and start making, taking steps towards refinement. Last night, how many of you were here in service yesterday evening? Now, we do these type of, Dr. Prowl sets up these prophetic presbyteries every Wednesday night that she's not here. And after every one of these presbyteries, I left the room frustrated. I go, Lord, we can do this better. Lord, something wasn't right last time. People were bored. It, it just, it, 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 the flow wasn't right. And I go, every time I ask the Lord, how can we do this better next time? And you notice how last night was completely different than any time that we've done a Wednesday night presbytery. And I didn't explain to anybody what I was doing. I just kind of, I, I just implemented it right on the spot, right from the pulpit. And I sent, I sent the presbyters to the four corners of, of the room. And I asked Elder Tony just to lead the worship of the worship team and to keep everyone in the room engaged in worship while the prophetic words were going, going forth. Because I wanted it to be better than last time. Yeah. 
And I was seeking the Holy Spirit, Lord, how can we do, do this better this time? And that's what I encourage every one of you to do. If you're in worship, Lord, how can I perform worship better next time or this time? Lord, if it's, if it's preaching, if you're a teacher of the word, you're a preacher, how can you do it better this time? How can you package the concepts that the people can receive it in a better way? Or if you're a student, and we're all students, I'm a student as well, how, how, Lord, how can I prepare myself to where, where I can receive in, in, a, in a better way? To where I can comprehend in a better way. Let everything in your life be a constant movement towards excel and to improvement. If you're having challenges with your kids, and you think every time I discipline them in this way, they have to do even more the next day. Well, you know what? Ask the Lord to help you in the way you discipline your kids. And not every two kids are alike. You know, if your child is stubborn, well, you need to find ways on, on, on how to break through that stubbornness and to get through to that child. Every personality is different. I'm telling you, I, I wish life was, was a cookie cutter. I wish I could just follow, I could just find that right mold that will fix that situation. But you know what? God keeps us depending upon Him. And I encourage you all to depend, to let your dependence on God increase every day. We live, especially in America, we, we live in a culture of, in, of total independence. And we, we often use words like self, you know, self-made man, and um, you know, kids are, are, are encouraged to become independent very quickly, and often kids are off on their own when they're 18, 19, 20 years old. But we live in a culture of being very, becoming very independent. And if you were to go to India and other places in the world, it's, the opposite is true. There's always a dependence. And, I'm saying, and I, I love that concept of independence in America, but what, one thing I don't like is we need to learn how to depend upon one another. And, and, and you know, it's, I remember in my career when I was just going through my schooling, I was seeking out mentors that would help me to accelerate my path to becoming successful in life. And I was amazed at how few people were willing to help me. But, but along the path, God sent people my way that were willing to help me. Because, you know, I did not want to make the same mistakes that I had seen others make. I wanted to make sure I was handling my 401k correctly. I wanted to make sure that I was progressing in my career properly. I wanted to make sure I was progressing in ministry properly and my relationships correctly. And when it came time for me, my, for me to meet my wife, that I'm going to handle that relationship properly, that I'm not going to sabotage my, mem- my marriage because of selfishness. So, so I encourage you to seek those out that are going to help you progress and at the same time, I encourage you to seek those out that you can help along the way. Because this is not a selfish journey. If you have a selfish walk, you're not walking in the ways of Torah. The ways of Torah is a lifestyle of being a gimel, of being a generous person. Being a generous man is to give things away and to, and, and, and to give of yourself. You know, you, you know two, Tuesday evening, and I don't know how Dr. Kral keeps the schedule that she does. It's, I'm just still in in awe of the way she goes and goes and goes. But by Tuesday night, I was I was totally wiped out. You know, it was a two-hour, two-hour plus drive to Granada Hills. I'd already worked a whole day and I'd gone to prayer. Then Bob and I got in the car and we went, we drove to the service. Then after that service, um, I just I just wanted to go home. But th- there was just like uh, I just ended up ministering to person after person after person. I don't think we got, we didn't get home until about two in the morning on, um, from that service. But I'm telling you, sometimes God expects you just to keep pouring yourself out and not to focus on yourself. And I struggle with selfishness. I just wanted to get in that car and just get home as quickly as I can and go to sleep because I had to get up early in the morning to work. But you know what? Sometimes God's going to try you to see how much you, you, you will submit to Him and pour yourself out for God's people. And I'm telling you, the people of this ministry are the most awesome people I've ever met in my life. I mean, you are all such beautiful people, and you love God, you love people, you're so generous in every single way. You're, you're generous with your talents, you're generous with your finances, you're generous w- with everything. And I, I really admire that about everybody. And a few weeks ago, I had a, the privilege to go to a, um, an author's workshop in San Diego. It was an event led by the, a guy named Mike Keenix. And I'm telling you, I was just blown away by every person I met there. Because everybody was more than willing to help each other out. Because we're, we're all, we, were all, we were all there with the same goal, to get our books published within the next few weeks. But everybody was willing to help each other. And I'm telling you, I've seen some of the most successful people are the ones that are willing to help others. Amen? Amen?
So I encourage you to make generosity of your time, of your life. I'm not telling you to get everything away. You know, you have to make a living and, and you, 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 every labor is worth their pay. I'm not telling you not, not to charge. But what I am telling you to do is to give of yourself and to, and, and to um, promise less than what you deliver. Right? And I've, I've heard Reverend Gray say that a lot. To, you know, to, I'm not sure if you under commit, but you over deliver. So if somebody, so what I try to do is I'll, I'll give you A, B, and C, but then give them a bonus, give them D as well. But, um, uh, uh, but don't overcommit and underdeliver. That's a horrible th thing to do, and that's very common. Where I'm, I'm, I'm told so many times, I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this. So, but then not a single thing is delivered upon. What I encourage you all to do is to really under, uh, you know, un, uh, you know, under promise and over and over deliver. I don't know why I'm going there, but it may be for somebody tonight. Let's go to the next letter, the Hebrew letter Tet. The tet represents the hand. Can you say hand? Yeah. And we have a unit of uh, you, the very first letter on the, at the, on, the, uh, on the wall here on your left side is the letter yud. It's the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's a letter that's suspended in the air. And it represents the hand. Let's read Tehillim 119, verse 73 together. It's on, on from this slide. Your hands made me and fashioned me, Enable me to understand, and I shall learn your commandments. So this you represents the hand that enables you to perform God's pleasure. To, it enables you to perform God's good pleasure. I don't have it in me to serve God fully. I need the hand of God to come upon me to help me to serve Him. There's areas in my life where I said, God, I'm never going to do that. I remember one time I said, I'm never going to go on the mission field. Well, guess what happened months later? I was out in the Philippines. I even told the Lord, I'm never going to get married in India. Well, guess what happens a few years later? I was in India getting married to Bauman, and this, which was the, the most wonderful thing that ever happened. But, but don't limit God and allow God to cause you to perform His good will. So let His hand lead you. Let Him push you along in the way He wants you to go. Some of you may say, I'll never be a public speaker. I never want to speak in front of people. Well, I've said that too. And I still say that. But you know what? Allow God to develop things in you that you don't want to do. Allow Him to stretch you. You know, the universe began with the Big Bang. And the expansion began when God said, let there be light. And the universe is, is like a, it's almost like a fabric. And... When God said, let there be light, and I'm giving you my opinion, of, of, of my interpretation of the, of the physical creation. God said, let there be light, and then the Big Bang began, and the universe began to expand from an infinitely small point, represented by the letter U, and it expanded, and it expanded, and it's still expanding to this day. And it continues to expand. Now, in your personal life, are you expanding? Are you being stretched? Are you growing to new heights? If you're in a very difficult situation where people are betraying you or falsely accusing you, are you becoming more and more bitter and angry at that person? Or are you allowing God to develop forgiveness and patience in that area? It's not easy, it's not easy at all. When those people when people wrong you, it's very it's very difficult to let those things go. And especially when people repeatedly wrong you, it's even harder to let it go. But sometimes forgiveness is a process. And, you, and we can't always forgive just in an instant. But allow God to, to give you the grace to enable you to release those things to God. Sometimes you just got to let people be people, and you can't control people. As much as we wish we could, we can't control people. So all I can do is work on myself. I can't work on you. I can't work on my wife, Bhavna. I can only work on myself. And I'll leave Bhavna with God. And Bhavna leaves me with the Lord. And we just allow God to work with each and every one of us. Amen? So God's hand made you, as you see in this word, and God's hand is fashioning you. God created man in his image. Now we always read that in the past tense. I want you to see it. I want you to see it in the continuous present tense. That means you are constantly being molded into the image of God. And that process is going to continue until you appear before him. And then you'll be completely complete, if that's even a word. 
So allow Him to perfect you. Let Him perfect those gifts that are within you. And let Him perfect forgiveness in you. David's greatest accomplishment was taking the yoke of repentance to perfection. He perfected repentance more than any one of his predecessors or even anyone after him. So allow him to perfect attributes within you. And I like to practice repentance every day in my life. I like to set time aside every single day to repent of, of, of wrongdoings and to make reparation and correction along the way. If I hurt somebody, I, I said something wrong to somebody, let me meet with that person and, tr and, 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 tr and try to fix that. All right? So, so uh, allow, and, and then give everyone permission to be themselves. You can't change anybody else. I'll, I'll let them be who they are. If, if there's a person that you're around all the time that's constantly angry, always bitter, you know what? So be it. You, you, you can do your best to have a, a relationship that works, but at the same time, don't stress yourself out trying to fix that person. If you're going to spend your entire life trying to fix people, you, you'll, you'll have no time for you to fix yourself. So, let's see, the next one is, oh, the last thing I want to share about the youth is God, is, you know, God's hand represents his, his hand in divine providence. God is the one that has provided you with all spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical gifts. Now, I wish I were an athlete, but I'm probably the worst athlete out there. I wouldn't even consider myself an athlete. But that's not a gift God's given me. And it's not even a gift that God wants me to develop. But so, so allow God to develop the gifts that are inside of you. And, and, and if you have a fear of things, allow God to help you overcome those fears. Because you can't go before God and say, I was afraid and that's why I didn't do what you told me to do. Let's go to the next letter, the letter Kaf. Remember how I said the Yud represents the hand of God? The calf represents the palm of God's hand. Let's read one, uh, Tehillim 119, verse 81 together. My soul pines for your salvation, for your word I hope. So David is expressing his longing to be sheltered in the palm of God's hand. And I encourage every one of you to be so devoted and just leaning into God and, and just let Him become your sustenance, let Him become your true love, and allow Him to help you in every area of your life. The letter Kaf, the letter Kaf, also represents a crown. The person who is devoted to God and places himself in God's hands will eventually be crowned with God's divine glory. And David is crying out to God to save him from those that seek his death. And you know, you, you know how David's life was. Even his own son Absalom tried to, tried to assassinate him. And he just leads him to God and said, God, you be my protection. You are, the, you, you are my protection. And tonight, Lord God, I ask you, Lord God, to help us to depend upon you completely through every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Amen? Let's come to the next letter, the letter Lamed. This is one of my favorite Hebrew letters. And the, the Lamed is the tallest letter of, the, of, of all the Hebrew letters. And it stands above every, every letter. And it represents, it represents the Word of God sustaining us. Let's read verse 89 together from the screen. Forever, O Lord, your Word sustains, I'm sorry, your Word stands in the heavens. Forever, O Lord, your Word stands in the heavens. The Lamed represents Torah study which is the highest value in one's life. The study of God's Word is to be of higher priority than any other form of study. Even more important than reading a blog site, it should be the highest priority in your life, the Word of God. Because all of creation is sustained by the Word of God. I'm not saying don't study, uh, don't study other things. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is let the Word of God be the primary thing that you study. Because that is the highest value in life. And David is telling us that God's word is eternally firm in heaven. Um, I'm going to show it to you from Hebrews 1.3. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, uphold, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had 
by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So this is speaking about Jesus crucified, resurrected, and, sit, and, and sitting at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the living olive bet. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is the olive bet. The Word is the Messiah. And one thing about the, the creation is, if God's Word ever stopped upholding, then all creation would cease to exist. Because God upholds all the creation by the word of His power. It's like the Hebrew letters are suspended throughout creation. So God keeps the planets orbiting. The Lord keeps the, the galaxies moving. God keeps the moon orbiting the earth. God keeps the earth and, and all the planets in our solar system orbiting our sun. God upholds everything by the word of His power. And if God ever ceased to be active in the creation, then the creation would cease to exist. Let's go to the next letter, the letter Mem. Mem represents a love for, for Torah. And, and it also represents increasing in our love of God's Word. Mem also means waters. This letter here is the enclosed Mem. There's also another form of the Mem that's an open Mem. Let's read Tehillim 119 verse 97 together. How I love your Torah all day it is my conversation. The Mem represents the Word. The Mem represents just being consumed and in love with God's Word. And being in love with God. That we're completely consumed in the love of God's Torah. I'm telling you, there are times where I've spent hours just studying and fellowshipping with the Lord. And I love it more than anything because it's, just, it's my desire. Then all day long, I'm just thinking about what I've studied that morning or that evening or, or whenever. It, it, it just, it's just something that cons consumes me. And there are times that where I, I, I've, you know, I've talked to many of you um, outside of the services. And we've talked about different concepts about, about the Torah. And, 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 you know, I've talked to Gregory and Joe and, 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 many, and many of you. It's just like we just love His Word and love His Torah. And I, just, I so look forward to coming here on Thursday evenings just to, to, just to study Torah with you. Because it's so exciting to dive into God's Word. It's so exciting. You know, we're all turning into Torah nerds. And it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> And David sings of his love for Torah. The, the, I mean, the love for Torah should, 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 be our, should be our love as well. And our love for Torah should continue to increase with the passage of time. We shouldn't become bored with God's Word. If you're becoming bored with God's Word, you need to really examine your relationship with the Word. Because there have been times in my journey with God where I just get bored with, with, with the Word. And that means that's a time where I need to step back, examine myself, and, and to get back to that place where I love His Word. And one, one of the beautiful things about being in this ministry, under Dr. Michelle Corral's ministry, is we never get bored with His Word. It's just we go from, we go from one glory to the next glory to the next glory. And the, His Word is so rich. And it just causes me to fall more and more in love with Him every single day. Let's go to the next letter, the letter Nun. Can you say Nun? Nun. Has a numerical value of 50, and it re Nun represents loyalty to God's commandments. Now, every, I'm beginning with the first eight, the first verse of every grouping of eight. So 50 is the numerical value of Nun. We're not going to talk about this numerical value tonight, but let's look at verse one, 105. Let's read it together. Your words are a lamp for my foot and a light for my path. The Nun stands for a loyal person who is completely devoted to God. If you go back to Joshua, and I believe also in Deuteronomy, Joshua is referred to as the son of Nun. And, and yes, his father's name may have been Nun, but more so what it, what it means is that Joshua was completely devoted to God. He was completely loyal to God. Is your Torah study making you more loyal to God? Is it making you more faithful to Him? If it's not, then you need to examine your Torah study. Because we, we, we need to uh, we, we need to analyze our journey every single step of the way. If, if you're becoming more bitter in life and you're studying Torah, there's probably something wrong with your Torah study because you should not be becoming more bitter. You should be, you, it should be the very opposite taking place. Right? 
So it, your character should be becoming more and more refined. You should be, you should be, you should be more compassionate than you were before. You should be developing godly character traits. If you're lacking in strength, you should be growing in strength. If you're lacking in, in lacking in endurance, well, your Torah study should build the stamina of endurance within you. And 50, there's many meanings of that 50. So the noon looks like it's kind of bent over a little bit, a slight, a slight bend in that letter. That represents total submission to God's will. So as we grow in God, we need to become more and more submitted to Him. The numerical value of noon is 50. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but let me just tell you one thing about it, the number. The 50 represents the 50 gates of understanding. There are 50 gateways to divine wisdom found in the Torah. And the person that is loyal to God, God will give that person the gift of illuminating, illuminating that person's soul to reach those 50 levels of insight. So as you walk with God, you're, He's going to illuminate your understanding and you're going, to grow, you're going to grow into greater and greater depths of God's Word. And not only in God's Word, He's also going to develop the application of God's Word. You know, let's say you're a supervisor in the workplace and you're managing a team. And well, you need God's help for you to manage every single individual on that team. And you, you need to learn exactly what it's going to take to get the best performance out of every single person on your team. And allow the Torah, allow Torah study, allow God to use the Torah study to illuminate your understanding. If, if, you're, a mom, if, you're, if you're a mom or a dad, God's going to teach you how to deal with every single one of, of your children and how to bring out the best in, in every child. Again, every child is not like a cookie cutter mold. It, everyone needs to be handled uniquely. Then let's go in Psalm. No, actually, you know, I talked about Joshua the son of Nun. Exodus thirty-three eleven talks about Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. You know, there's a reason why God chose Joshua to, to take over after he died. God did not choose any of Moses' sons. And Moses' sons were fully capable of, of carrying the Israelites to the promised land. But that's it. Moses wanted one of his sons to take over, but that wasn't God's will. It was God's will that Joshua, the son of Nun, take over the congregation of Israel. And that was because he was a man of Torah study. It's because he was a man that departed not out of the tabernacle. And he, and he was loyal to his master, to Moses. And, I, I, and I, I can imagine, I can only begin to imagine... The, the inadequ inadequacies that Joshua may have felt. I mean, can you imagine becoming the successor to Moses? Moses, the greatest prophet that ever walked on the face of the earth, with the exception of Messiah, of course. No one, great, uh, no one is greatest Messiah. But, I mean, Moses, such a brilliant man, a brilliant person, absolutely phenomenal in, in every single area, a great leader, a, 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 a great intercessor, Love God's people. I'm a, a Torah scholar of Torah scholars. And then you're going to have, and then Joshua was thinking, I can't step in this man's shoes. But you know what? He said yes. And look what God did with Joshua. Joshua experienced greater miracles in his ministry than, 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 than even Moses, in, in my opinion. The collapsing of the walls of Jericho. You know, we've all, we've all sang all those songs of the walls of Jericho coming down. But you know what the rabbis teach us about the walls coming down? They say the walls collapsed into the ground so that the Joshua and the soldiers could cross on, on, on flat ground. The walls collapsed into the ground. And when it came time for them, for them to cross the promised land, Joshua did not command, you know, God did not part the sea the way he parted the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds. God caused the the Jordan River for the waters to pile upon each other. So it's like it's like a bank. And, and the waters kept piling higher and higher and higher until so the waters were stacked up several stories high. And then the Israelites crossed on dry ground. But the miracles that Joshua experienced were tremendous. And God also used Joshua to command the sun to stand still. Meaning that he just caused time to stop. But for, for a certain period of time, so that, so that they could they conquer the people they were fighting. So, I mean, Joshua said yes, and God did the rest. And I invite every one of you to allow God to do the rest.
Because I believe we're going to see greater miracles in these last days than, than, than even which Jesus performed when he walked on the face of the earth. Yeah. It's written like that in the Gospels. So allow God to be God and just, I, all I encourage you to do is just say yes to him. Don't worry about being, being inadequate. Not one, of us, not one of us is qualified for the test. Not one of us has, has all the right points in our resumes for the test. Because it's not us doing it anyway. It's he that's working through us. Amen? So just be like Joshua, the son of Nun. Let's, we're actually going to finish tonight. Let's go to the next letter, the Samak. Can we say Samak? It has a numerical value of 60. It, uh, let's read this together. I hate those who harbor iniquitous thoughts, but your Torah I love. And the letter Samak, it literally means support. And that teaches us that God supports all those that rely upon Him. So it's like He's our foundation. He's our support. And these eight verses speak about relying upon Him. He's our all-encompassing protection. In verse 116, it, David is asking God to support him. And David is recognizing God's presence everywhere in his life. He's protected from all sides. So regardless of where you go, God is your protection. If you're going to the courtroom, God is your protection. Wherever you go, if you're, even if you're surrounded by your enemies, God is your protection. I mean, and David is steadfast in his love for Torah. Let's go to the Ayin, which has a numerical value of 70. Let's read Psalm 119, verse, 20, verse 121 together. I perform justice and righteousness do not lead me to my oppressors. Ayin, it means I. It also represents a pauper. And it teaches us that it is a man's duty to support the poor. And it is also teaches us that true poverty is, is one that has a poverty of mind and soul. And the way I should come to Torah class or to anything I do in service to God is I come in the mindset of a, of a pauper, of a poor person, because I am completely dependent upon God to learn His Holy Torah. If I come in here like I know it all, well guess what? Even the little that I know will be taken away from me. Because I have to be completely dependent upon Him. It's He that teaches me. Now let me give you an example in, in the natural. When I finished high school, I thought I knew it all. When I finished college, I realized I knew nothing. Because the more I learned, the more I learned how little I knew. And then when I entered the workplace, I learned much of what I had learned in my college years as well in, in terms of my field. Be because, and if that's true in the natural, how much more true is it in the spiritual? So don't, don't become prideful in your study of God's Word. Always be dependent upon Him and allow Him to teach you new things. You know, I thought I knew the Gospels inside and out. Then I came to Dr. Claude's MST class, and everything I thought I knew, I realized I didn't know. And I had to relearn everything correctly. And I'm still learning, because I barely scratched the surface. When you study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from a rabbinic perspective, and, and, you, and, you, and you take the cow, you, you remove the cowboy hat from Jesus' head, and put on the, the yarmulke that he should have on and you learn about the Jewish Jesus. It, it, I mean, most of us don't know who the Jewish Jesus is. And the Bible is written by Jews. And we need to learn how to embrace the Jewish Jesus. And to embrace true spiritual poverty that we're dependent upon God for everything. The numerical value of Ayin is 70. And, you know, and I, the Ayin represents the, the, the eyes. And the teaching here is there are 70 approaches to Torah comprehension. And the eye will discover them all with dedicated study and effort. So there are 50 levels of understanding, and there are 70 approaches to Torah study, or Torah comprehension. Maybe one day we'll study those. Let's come to the, number, the next letter, the letter Pei. Can you say Pei with me? Now, the previous letter of Ayin represents the eyes. No, yeah, eyes, and the, but the pay represents the mouth. And it has a numerical value of 80, 
And let's read Psalm 119, verse 129. Your testimonies are hidden, therefore my soul kept them. The letter pay, or the word pay, literally means mouth. And the very shape of the letter, with its opening on the side, resembles in an open mouth. The letter represents the mouth following the eye, which represents the eyes. And that teaches us that we need to be able to, the, uh, before we speak, we need to understand and comprehend before we speak. So I need comes before pay, pay because the eyes represent comprehension, it represents understanding, but once you understand the concept, then you can open your mouth with the pay and speak what you have, what the Lord has shown you. So a person should not speak before he studies and sees the truth with, with his own eyes. And God's word is hidden, as David says, your testimonies are hidden. The deep things of God are hidden. But if, if, if you dive in and you come in as a pauper, God will, will reveal secret things to you. Remember when Jesus spoke to the multitudes? He spoke in parables. He never spoke in public without speaking in parable form. And even when Moses wrote Genesis chapter 1, it's all written in parable form. The creation is written in the form, in a style of, of a parable. But when Jesus was in private with, with his disciples, he spoke to them plainly and explained the parables to them. So as you, as you spend time with them and you fall in love with them, allow him to show you the deeper significance of the word. I'm telling you, God is going to make things so plain to you, and he's going to show you how to apply the deepest, the deepest truths of his Torah in life. You know that many people that go to all different types of seminars, and I encourage you to do all those seminars. But more so, I encourage you to spend time in, in the study of God's Word, because all knowledge is found in the Word of God. Everything is found in the Word of God. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. God's ways are so much higher than our ways, but He wants to reveal His ways to us. So let's seek him and allow him to teach us. Let's come to the next letter, the Zadik. The, the numerical value of Zadik is 90. And let's read Tehillim 119, 137 together. You are righteous, O Lord, and your judgments are upright. Now that letter Zadik has two bent heads. And it symbolizes the hallmark of the righteous. I'm actually reading this to you from the art scroll. It represents extraordinary submission to God. And the Zadik follows the Ayin and the Pei. Remember the two previous letters? We have Ayin, Pei, and then we have Zadik. So the Zadik, if, if, if he has the eyes, which is that he has comprehension, and then he has the Pei, which means that he's able to teach and speak and deliver what he's learned, that is the person that guards his eyes and his mouth. And he humbly submits his voice and visions to God. And he merits the title righteous. The Hebrew word for a righteous man is zadik. If you want to be called a zadik, then you must learn how to guard your mouth and your eyes. You need to learn how to control your ayin and your pay. And even when the wicked prosper, the zadik does not waver in, in his faith. I'm saying he, but it, can, it applies to both male and female. This also represents a righteous person humbly accepts all things in life. So if evil comes their way, if poverty comes their way, they never waver in, with their faith in God. If sickness comes, they never waver in their faith in God. They're steadfast in their connection with God. And all of God's ways are seen as true. And every one of us are going to go through times of difficulty. You know, you may, have, you may go through a period in your life where everything's just going wonderful. Every, you're building tremendous wealth. You're extremely successful in, in your business, in your ministries, in your family. And then all of a sudden, sickness hits you. That's when the test comes. Are you, are you going to remain faithful to God? Or are you, are you, are you going to curse and reject God because sickness has come? But what I do encourage you to do is allow God to activate the Torah that's in you and allow Him to help you through that situation and let Him develop your character even through that sickness. Allow God to work through every single situation of your life. Let's go to the next letter, the Kuf. Can you say Kuf with me? Kuf. Kuf represents sanctity, and it re represents repentance. 
That tweets to Helen 119, 145. I called with all my heart. Answer me, O Lord. I shall keep your statutes. Now, one thing about this letter Resh, and this letter Kuf, it represents sanctity. It, it represents one that strives towards repentance. How many of you strive towards repentance? It's not something that we do very often. But we should strive towards repentance. David spent his entire life repenting of the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. Do we strive towards repentance? It's not enough just to say, Lord, I, I've sinned, forgive me, I repent of my evil ways. Yes, that's the first step. But then you need to work out that repentance to work at the very root of it to remove from yourself. Some of you may ask, why do I keep, why do I keep, why do I keep committing the same sin over and over and over and over and over again? It's because you haven't completed the repentance. So if it's gossip that you struggle with all the time, you know what? There, there's a root in there that hasn't been removed. And maybe there's an insecurity in you that you always have to bring other people down to make yourself feel better. Or you, you, you may always feel the need that you always have to be your teacher's pet. You always have to be the favorite. And you put other people down to make sure you keep your position as the favorite. If that's what you're doing, there's something very unhealthy in the character. You know, maybe you didn't receive the love from mom and dad the way you, the way you long for. And you're making up for it in the, in the workplace or in ministry. And the first step is to recognize that you have a problem and then take steps towards repentance and take steps towards repairing that problem. Not one of us is perfect. I'm not here to put anybody down. If anything, I'm preaching to myself more than anybody else. So, but the, the key is we need to walk in the realm of the Baal. We need to see things with truth. And, and also, don't try to fix anybody else. You can only work on yourself. I can teach you, I can exhort you, but I can't change anybody. And but one thing I'm very grateful for, that I have seen change in many of you in this room. Because, you, because you're taking steps toward character refinement. So these eight verses, starting in Psalm 119, 145, are all about the call to repentance. Let's go to the next letter, the letter Resh. Can you say Resh? Let's read Psalm 119, verse 153. See my affliction and release me, for I have not forgotten your Torah. Now let me give you a, another um, interpretation of this. The resh, this letter represents a wicked person. It represents the wicked. And the letter before the, be, the, letter before the resh is the kuf. And what it's saying is, God turns his back toward the wicked person. Just as the resh has its back towards the, the kuf. Can you, can you flip back one slide, please? Uh, Rabbi Joe, thank you. So, and then let's go back to the next, let's go back to resh. So, these two letters are back to back. The kuf has its back towards the resh. God has his back towards those that, are, that walk in wickedness. Now, there's another means of resh, but for this portion, I want us to focus on resh meaning wicked. And God turns his back towards the wicked. And then David cries out, because David is calling himself a wicked person. He says, see my affliction and release me, for I have not forgotten your Torah. Resh represents the wicked. And the wicked man is so arrogant that he puts himself ahead of everyone else, including God. And the Resh symbolizes a wicked person turning his back on God. But God does not look on the face of the wicked. And so what David is doing is saying, God, see my affliction. See my wicked ways. And he's pleading with God, release me from the cruel burden of affliction and pain. And, 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 and enable me to affect, allow me to embrace the burden of Torah. And to accept the burden of Torah. Because our sin hardens us. Sin makes us more arrogant. And when we get to that, and, and David came, came into a very hardened state. After he sinned with David, after he sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah, he covered that sin for almost a year, he, and he was completely able to justify it by the letter of the law, which we talked about several weeks ago. But in his repentance, he's crying out to God, and God will cause you, God will cause those walls to come down, 
and God will cause you, and, God, and that relationship with God will, will return once again. Let's go to the next letter, the letter Shin. The numeric, uh, actually it has a numerical value of 300. Tehillim 119, 161, let's read this. Princes pursued me for nothing, but my heart feared your word. The letter Shin represents falsehood. Look at the bottom of the letter Shin here on the screen here. The Shin, notice how it's on the bottom, it's, uh, it's pointed. I think almost every other letter that has a, a base is flat, it's almost flat on the bottom. But this letter is pointed at the bottom, and there's a reason for that. The bottom comes to a point, and this alludes to falsehood that cannot endure for long. So if you walk in falsehood, if you walk in rationalization, just like that, a, an object that has a point at the bottom, it will not stand, it will not endure for very long. And David here is speaking about his son Absalom and all the princes that turned against him. And he's saying, and David said that powerful princes and generals like Saul and Absalom pursued me and threatened me, yet they, they instilled no fear in me. The only thing that David feared was that he would transgress against, against God's command. Can you imagine? Here's Absalom, his son, that tries to kill him at near the end of his life. I think David, at the time of Absalom's rebellion, I think he was 65 years old at the time. He died at age 70. And then earlier, early, early part of his life, David, David was I mean, not David. Uh, King Saul was after him, trying to kill him. But David feared not fulfilling God's commandments more than being killed by these two men. I mean, how many of us have that much love for God and for His commandments and for His ways? That walking in righteousness is more important. The fear of breaking God's law is greater than the fear of the enemies attacking and destroying him. And I can think of situations in, in, in Bob and, and, and my life where so many people turned against us and spoke so many wicked things and, and lies against us. And it got to a point where I had to stop defending myself because it was, it was coming to no avail. To where I go, Lord, it's more important for us to walk in your ways and to serve you and to serve in ministry and, and, and to develop our relationship with you and, and, and to commit ourselves completely to you. That's more important to us than, 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 than the wicked. Not to say that they're wicked, just what was taking place was wicked. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't call any person wicked. But we, we should long... I should be more afraid of not performing God's will than the fear of my enemies destroying me. My reputation should be less important than what God thinks about me. Amen. Amen? So my desire, my longing should be for God alone. And man's going to fail me all the time. I can, there's not a day that will go by where someone won't speak ill of me, but so be it. I, don't, I should not spend my life, I should not make my life a career of defending myself. Just let, let, God, let God deal with people. People are going to be people. And, amen? I mean, there's, there's not, not one of us is perfect. So I can't, I, I can't hold the stone at anybody. But I go, Lord, just let me not sin against you. And let me not fail you. Let me not fail you in the workplace. On my day job Monday through Friday. Let me not fail you in ministry. Which seems to be my night job at times. But uh, just, Lord, don't let us fail you. We want to fulfill every task that you give us to do. Because my only fear is that I may fail you. My only fear is that I may transgress against your word. So that, that's what it means. That's what the shin represents. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So our fear should be of God alone. Man can't do anything to us. If they kill a body, then we're present with God. Now we come to the finale. I have been trying to get to the top for the last four or five weeks. And don't worry, Joe, this will be the last time you have to show this light. So the thing, let's go, let's thank Brother Joe. He's been so, so gracious to help us tonight. I don't know if all, all these weeks, so thank you. The Hebrew letter Tav has a numerical value of 400. It's the, and it represents truth. It represents the final and ultimate purpose of all of one's pursuits. It represents 
I was going to say it, represent, it represents the American way. No, it doesn't represent the American way. It, repent, it re represents the fullness and the sealing of creation. Just the fulfillment of truth. And Jesus said in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, meaning I am the Aleph and the Tom. And let's read Tehillim 119, 169 together. May my soul of prayer draw near before you, O Lord. According to your word, enable me to understand. The Tav represents truth because it's the final letter of the Word of God. It teaches that truth is the final and ultimate purpose of all pursuits and actions. So we want, in every area of life, we want to come to the perfection of truth. One of the rabbis teaches that Tav is covenant with, with desire. Man's ultimate desire and all-compassing passion should be for truth. That since the seal of God himself is truth, the man who finds truth will also find the path which leads to God. And David is, is aspiring to draw close to God. He prays in songful praises. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So Jesus is the truth. And he is the way. Amen? I'm going to invite Rebetz and Kiyashan, if you'll come up and lead us in a, in a, in a song of worship. But let's just all stand now as, as, we, as we begin to worship Him once again. And Lord, I just ask you, Lord God, to make all 20 dimensions of truth active in our life. And Lord, make the, the study and the love in our passion for Torah become the ultimate passion in our lives. Lord, increase the passion in us. Increase our love for you more than any other love. Lord, we long for your presence. We long for you. We long for you in this house, Lord God. We long, Lord God, that you're going to make all the crooked places straight in our lives. We just depend upon you, Lord God, for everything. And if you will, just, if you'll, uh, just rise with me, please, and let's just worship the Lord. He's so good, isn't he? He's so good. Lord, we give you all the glory for tonight's nice worship.
salvation, your testimony is over us. We thank you that in your words, your thoughts are over us. You have the thoughts for your people, oh God. And we just give you glory now.